Good evening, hello, welcome, good to see you all again. It's another horribly rainy day in Canberra. We're back inside the grow tent and even though it's only about 7 or 8 degrees outside at the moment, it is still nearly 30 degrees in the tent so if I do sweat a little bit, don't be too alarmed. Thank you to everybody that's come along today and especially if you did watch my first video. Um, if you haven't watched that video, I do recommend that you go back and have a watch of that one, especially if you're interested to know how I put this list of the world's best figs together. Now in that video, I talk about exactly what I did and I also have the first 10 list figs on that list, ranked from 40 down to 31. I'd especially like to thank all those people that had a bit of a stab and a guess of what you think might be in the top 10 list. And I thought I might up the ante a little bit, make it a little bit more fun by throwing in a prize for whoever might be the best guesser by the end of this. So I have here, you might have seen in my Celeste tasting video, this is a cutting board that I had designed to be used in my tasting videos. It's got a nice little etching of a fig down here. It's got a logo on the board. And uh, I will have one of these made up and sent out to whoever guesses the top 10 list closest anywhere in the world that you may be. And how are we going to determine who does the best, I hear you all asking. Well, we're going to do a very similar thing to what I did with my fig list. What I'm going to do is score your responses. If you put in your top 10 uh, fig list a fig that's in the correct position with the correct name, I'm going to give you four points. If you uh, put a fig either side of the correct position, I'm going to give you two points. And if you are uh, somewhere else in that top 10, but it is a fig on that list, I'm going to give you one single point. We're going to sum up all the scores of everyone that wants to participate. And then at the end, the person with the highest score wins. Now, in the event that we have a tie with multiple people uh, with the same score, we're going to go to a tie break around. And what I'm actually going to do is I will choose a fig somewhere outside of the top 40. And I'll ask you guys to guess which rank it placed in. The person that... Uh, uh, gets the closest number to the actual ranking wins easy peasy and so without much more talking from me today we're going to jump straight into the list we do have a little bit of a revision though to our past list i found when doing research for today's video that i had two figs in my list that were uh, synonyms they were they were different names for the same fig and so i had to combine them together and what that did meant was it meant a, there was a gap in my list and everything got shuffled down one place so the previous number 40 fig is now the number 39th fig which means we have a spot open for a new number 40 40. And that new number 40 is our first pure Adriatic type to enter the list. Now we have had Adriatic hybrids in the list. So uh, we had the Canadria fig, which was an Adriatic hybrid, but this is the first pure Adriatic type and it's called Bataglia green. Now the Adriatic types of fig are a type of fig that share very similar characteristics with each other. They all come from Italy and they uh, have a green to yellow type skin, usually a bright green skin that goes a little bit yellow as it ripens. They have bright red flesh and they're usually uh, strawberry flavored inside. They're very well regarded across um, across the States. They, they have an excellent flavor and people really do rave about those figs. And Bataglia green is no different. It's said to potentially be a little bit lighter than some of the other Adriatic types. Um, it has that bright green skin. It's got the red flesh and great flavor. Uh, it's said uh, uh, Bataglia Green actually tied in 40th place with two other figs, which was Brunswick and Sal's Corleone. Uh, they all scored 28 points. However, this uh, fig edged itself into the uh, official 40th spot by having slightly more people vote for it. Had nine people vote for this fig in the top five. So today's video would have started with number 30, but our previous number 29, uh, our previous number 31 has now slid into that position. So if you want to know more about Par Paradiso, go back into my last video and uh, hear what I had to say about that particular fig. So we'll jump straight into the 29th spot. And this is a little bit of an interesting one because this isn't an individual fig. It's actually a class of figs. And in my last video, I did mention that we would talk about this class of figs a little bit more and they are called the Mount Etna types. And the reason that this came in the list as the Mount Etna types rather than an individual fig is because a lot of people when they chose their top five uh, figs didn't want to put five figs of the same category in there. They didn't want five Mount Etna types or five Adriatic types or five honey types. And so what they would do, they found it really difficult to kind of separate, separate out their favorite Mount Etna types. And they would say something like a Mount Etna type or Mount Etna types. And that's how this ended up in the list. And in fact, so many people uh, call just the Mount Etna types that they ended up in the 29th spot. Now the Mount Etna types are a type of fig that have been traced back to Sicily, unsurprisingly to a mountain called 
called Mount Etna. And this is actually a volcano and in fact one of the most active volcanoes in the world. Now Sicilian figs are usually a little bit on the larger side and they usually like a little bit of a warmer climate. However up Mount Etna uh, there's a bit of a microclimate going on. The higher altitudes lead to cooler conditions and the Mount Etna figs are typically very well adjusted to colder temperatures and they can come down to lower uh, hardiness zones in the US. So the Mount Etna types are usually all dark skinned. They usually are small to medium figs. They have a, a, a deep red interior and they are usually moderate to strongly berry flavored with varying degrees of sweetness. Now there have been studies done on the Mount Etna figs, genetic studies that have placed them in the genetic family and they have found that some of the Mount Etna figs are actually genetically identical or at least very very similar. Even though that might be the case there are people out there that swear by the differences of these figs and some people will rank, rank Mount Etna figs higher than other Mount Etna figs and we'll see that in our list because as we go up and especially as we get into the higher ranks we will see more Mount Etna figs appear in our list. So the Mount Etna types came in the 29th spot. They scored 37 points in total and they were voted by 11 people in their top 5 figs. Moving on and outside of Australia Many people believe that Australia's capital city is Sydney, but it's actually where I'm sitting right now in Canberra. Canberra is the capital city of Australia. We're a very small city. In fact, we're the second uh, smallest city in Australia. We have two events of the year that people uh, come in from other states to see. One of them is in January and it's called Summer Nats. It's a car festival and the hoons come in and they do burnouts and drag race and all that sort of stuff. And a much more quieter kind of festival, which is on right now and is a flower festival called Floriad. And so it's a appropriate that one of the earliest entries in our list today is the very similarly named Floria. Now Floria is a Serbian fig. It was introduced to the fig community by a user called Herman2 on the old Figs for Fun forums. Uh, it's unique fig in its cold hardiness. It is cold hardy down to negative 17 degrees Celsius or even more. For the Americans playing along at home, that's negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And what's even more amazing about it is there are reports that even at these low temperatures, this plant can still hold on to its braber crop and then ripen those fruit when the majority of figs out there would have been burnt to toast at those temperatures. Uh, this is one of the earliest cropping varieties out there with an early cropping braber and an early cropping main crop. It's got a mottled green brown skin. It's usually of a small to sometimes medium size, uh, and it's said to be possibly synonymous with a um, with a Bulgarian variety called Michurinska 10. Michurinska 10 is one of the most common varieties in Bulgaria. Uh, it's also a extremely cold tolerant variety that looks very very similar. Now, whilst this uh, particular fig isn't going to win any trophies for flavour, it is still said to be a very nice, sweet, if linear tasting fig. But where it really shines is that cold tolerance it really extends out the range of possible locations where you can grow a fig now this fig scored 40 points and was voted on by 13 people in my list securing the 28th spot now the 27th spot now after all my research this is the one that so far struck me as the one that i need i want i covet i have to find unfortunately i don't think it's available in australia but that won't stop me looking this fig is called the unknown pastillier now this Fig is uh, said to have a pronounced cherry flavor, which why it interests me so much. There are possibly multiple varieties of this fig passed around, and there's been a lot of research done on this fig, particularly in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. And they were done by, amongst others, Ira Condit of the Canadria fame and his colleague Gustav Eisen. Now, in 1901, Eisen wrote of this fig, if the writer could plant only one blue variety, it would certainly be this fig. The fine form of the tree, its abundant cropping, and the superior quality of fruit should make this a favourite for all across the Pacific coast. Not all researchers were uh, equally pleased with this fig. Another researcher wrote that the fruits of this introduction were small, purplish black and uh, of no particular value either fresh or dried. Another researcher wrote that whilst it had a large crop in 1892, in 1895 it was utterly worthless with the figs souring and spoiling on the tree. There are different reports even amongst the same research onto some of the characteristics of pastillier. For instance, Eisen said on one case that the skin of the fruit was covered in a very fine downy fuzz. 
Eisen then came a few years later and said of the fruit that it has a totally smooth skin with no hints of down or wax even when magnified. So it is possible that there is uh, more than one variety of fig named, uh, possibly a blue fig named Pastillier floating out there. And in fact the spot here isn't reserved for Pastillier, it's reserved for a fig called Unknown Pastillier. And this fig actually came from San Diego. There was um, somebody that attended a grower's market and they purchased a fig from a grower over there and the grower wasn't quite sure what the fig actually was. So the person that bought the fig, they took it home and they let it fruit and they looked at the fruit and they said it looked quite similar to a pastillier. And so they called the fig unknown pastillier. Uh, today there's still possibly varieties fl uh, floating about including the original one that was studied by Ira Condit. Uh, and if that's the case, that is actually on my list as well. The uh, the Pastillier, for people that didn't put down specifically unknown Pastillier, that ranked as 74 on my list. And were everybody referring to this same unknown Pastillier variety, it would actually be a lot higher in my list here today. So it's unique in its flavor, having a very strong cherry flavor and the cherry is meant to be exactly like the flavor of a real cherry which is why it interests me so much it's also an extremely beautiful fig it's got a kind of a bluey purple to dark purple skin it's got a deep red uh, flesh it has small to medium fruits but can sometimes pump out quite a big fig uh, it's not without its problems though it does suffer from fruit drop and many people out there actually say it's very likely to be a Smyrna type which requires caprification in order to hold its fruit. Other people said that as the fruit fig gets a little bit older, once it's six or seven years old, that uh, it does tend to grow out of this a little bit and it does hold a percentage of the fruit even without caprification. However, I wouldn't rely on it. It's not a particularly vigorous tree either. Some people have had problems with cuttings and saying that it, it can be quite uh, lethargic in the way it grows and that it could be suited off better to a graft. Uh, when it does hold its fruit, it's both early and prolific and uh, it it's just sounds like an exceptional fig to me, one that I really, really want. The Unknown Pastillier scored 27 points on my list, voted in by 12 people. Now the 26th spot, and for this fig, we're going to cast our minds back. We're going to cast it all the way back to 1768 in England. And a very famous gentleman called Captain James Cook is preparing the endeavour to set sail on the Pacific Ocean. Approximately two years later, he's going to land on a little rock we're all going to come to know and love as Australia. Now, at the exact same time, there were Franciscan missionaries breaking ground for the first time in one of their missions in San Diego. They planted in the ground a fig tree and they would then take that variety and plant it in all their missions across the Californian coast. And the fig is, of course, the Black Mission fig. Now, the Black Mission fig is still an extremely popular fig today. It's a very popular commercial variety and it's also one of the most abundant figs, especially in California and in other areas in the USA. Uh, being a variety that seems to be everywhere according to the Americans that I've read online. I hope I'm not wrong. Uh, it is a high quality fig. It has an extremely high quality braver as well as a main crop. It's a dark fig with a, a dark amber to red interior. It can be quite sweet and it can exhibit mild to moderate berry flavors. Ripe figs can also show an attractive cracking across the fruit of the plant, uh, the plant, the fruit, uh, and it's not particularly cold tolerant, although it can handle some chill. It definitely prefers a warmer environment. This is an extremely popular fig. It scored 47 points and was voted on 16 times as someone's top five figs. The next fig on our list in position 25 is another Mount Etna type fig. The fig is called Black Malta and it came from a nursery on Long Island called the Belle Claire Nursery. It was said to have originated in Malta and it shares some of those great characteristics of the other Mount Etna figs. It is a small to medium fig. It has a dark skin and a red interior with sweet, uh, moderate to strong berry flavours. It has a closed tight eye and it is an extremely good producer of prolific figs and it is a vigorous growing plant. It is hardy down to about zone 6. It has a thick skin and a tightly closed eye. And this fig is raved about for its hardiness, its reliability, its prolific cropping and its flavour. Some say it should be the standard fig or a standard fig for all fig collectors and enthusiasts. It comes in the 25th spot, scoring 52 points and being voted for by 19 people in their top 5 figs. 
Another early ripener finds its way into our 24th spot and it is called the Improved Celeste. Now the Improved Celeste comes from a breeding program held by the University of State Louisiana where they used Celeste as a parent and came up with a number of really famous and popular varieties such as the LSU Purple, the LSU Tiger, the LSU Champagne, the LSU Hollia and potentially some others. And whilst they did release a number of these varieties, this variety I'm talking about right now, Improved Celeste, wasn't formally released by the university. In fact, it was a cutting that was taken from somebody that worked on the program and was passed around the community and when lovingly adopted the name Improved Celeste. So they were looking to improve Celeste because they are, the Celeste is quite small fruit and it did suffer from a little bit of fruit drop. They did seem to meet their goals with Improved Celeste, even if they didn't release the plant. The fruit is about 30% larger than Celeste uh, and it is also less likely to drop its fruit. It has kind of a dusky brown to deep purple fig uh, depending on how ripe it is and how much heat there has been. It has got a nice amber interior and it is a sugar sweet fig much like its uh, mother Celeste. It's suited to a range of climates. It does exceptionally well in humid and rainy climates. It rarely ever splits. It's a very, a very early producer like Celeste and it's a honey type. Uh, it can be extremely sweet if allowed to ripen on the tree and it's a very popular fig. It's called 54 points on my list and it was voted for by 18 people as one of their top five. And moving straight along, we have another fig from the exact same program which has made the 23rd spot and that is the LSU Purple. Now LSU Purple can be a little bit of a contentious fig in terms of flavour. Some people say that it's a little bit bland and watery and other people say that when you get it perfectly ripe, it is sensational. The LSU uh, Purple is obviously a purple fig um, and people say that when it's uh, perfectly ripe, it has intense sugar and maple flavours with a little bit of spice in there. And in fact, Ross Raddy, Raddy labels this fig as a spicy or bitter type flavouring figs and says there's a taste of cinnamon in the skin. When it is perfectly ripe, people have said the flavour is so intense as to be like caramel or maple candy. Uh, it's an excellent choice for containers. Uh, it can stay, withstand rain and humidity. It has a nice tight eye. And uh, this fig scored 57 points on my list. It was voted on by 17 people as one of their top five figs. And moving along to the 22nd spot, and finally we have a fig that is actually common in Australia. In fact, it's common all over the world. It's a much maligned fig. It's sometimes outrightly dismissed and put down by members of the fig community, but it has still managed to land itself in that 22nd position. The fig is, of course, brown turkey. And my list actually differentiates by uh, English brown turkey and other brown turkey types, which we're talking about right now. The English brown turkey uh, ended up in the 59th spot on my list. Now, it was actually named in England from a variety that they believed came from Turkey, and it is an extremely old variety. There are writings that go back to 1768 by a gentleman of the name of Miller who said of the brown turkey that it was so well known that it needs no description. It can produce medium to large figs and occasionally very large figs. Uh, the flavour is quite linear in profile, uh, in most cases being uh, sugar sweet and sometimes with a drop of honey in the eye, some people say it can be a little bit watery or, or bland. Uh, it, is a it is a brown to violet colour and uh, it's a very common fig to be misnamed. So if there's a brownish colored fig, that's a very common fig wherever you live and it's not a particularly amazing tasting fig, it's very likely to cop the name brown turkey and that might actually contribute to its poor reputation. Uh, there is often a little bit of fig snobbery that comes into this as well. A lot of people, because it's so common, would rather a much more interesting variety and they will turn their noses up at a brown turkey fig. And I must admit I might be one of them, although I do have at least one brown turkey in the collection. I don't know if I've actually tried a brown turkey, if I've ever ripened one, uh, but this year certainly I'll have one to try and I'll throw my own two cents in the ring to see what I think it's worth. There are actually some many positives for this fig as well. It's extremely uh, hardy. Um, it's a, it's adapted to a very wide range of difficult conditions, including extremely hot conditions, extremely dry conditions. In fact, some nurseries say that this fig is impossible to kill, or they're just about impossible to kill. 
So it has both a braber crop, it also has a main crop of equal quality and the, some of the figs can be absolutely ginormous. Condit wrote of brown turkey that alongside Celeste, it was the most common dooryard fig from Texas, east of Florida and north of Maryland. So obviously some people out there don't mind this fig too much at all. And so despite all the haters, the brown turkey secured itself the 22nd position in my list, scoring 58 points, beating out all the other figs before and having 17 people voted in to their top five figs. And that leaves us with our last fig for today, number 21 on my list, and this is a honey fig. The fig is called Peter's Honey, and it's another fig that's originally from Sicily. It was brought to America by the name uh, for, by a man of the name Peter Danner of Portland. Uh, as the name suggests, it's a honey fig. It's got a yellow to amber interior, um, and some people said that when it's perfectly right, this particular fig can be as sweet as a spoon of honey. It's a small to medium sized uh, fig. It has a green to yellow skin and has a uh, yellow to amber interior. It does prefer a warmer climate and will ripen to its fullest potential in a warmer climate. But if you are in a cooler climate, this fig will apparently do well against a sunny wall where it can pick up some extra heat. Uh, and uh, it's worth giving it a shot. So Peter's Honey finishes off our list today in the 21st spot. It scored 59 points and had 16 people place it in their top five figs. So what do you think? Is it everything you dreamed and hoped for? Is it everything you expected? Were there any surprises in there? Chuck it all in the comments below. And again, if you do want to have a step at that top 10 list, chuck it in the comments. I'll be tabulating them all together and uh, furiously calculating your score to see how we go up until that top 10 list. I do hope to get the next list out probably about the same time. It took me around a week to get this together. It's actually around, I've got some notes in front of me here. You've probably seen me looking down to refresh my memory on them. And there's actually around three and a half thousand words I tapped up on this so it is not a it's not a it's a lot of reading points for me to go across and my poor old brain is uh is shrinking a bit with overload at the moment but I, I hope you enjoyed this video um I'd love to see you again in the next one and uh, again if you did appreciate this all those buttons don't need to talk about them anymore so I guess I'll just have to see you all in the next one catch you later